Thanks for joining us today for this webinar on TEA's revised school facility standards. Uh, as with anything in the Texas Education Code, the language requires some detailed reading and reflection and potentially some additional guidance or clarification from TEA. So our goal today is to highlight a few of the more significant changes and explore their potential impact on district facility planning and construction. And I'm excited that joining me to talk about the ramifications of uh, some of these changes are Dr. Jennifer Duplessis, the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations for Lovejoy ISD, and Julie Sands, the Senior Project Manager for Louisville ISD. So thanks to both of you uh, for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to join us for this discussion. We really appreciate that. Uh, before we jump into the discussion itself, I wanted to start with a little bit of background to frame what's happened. So back in 2019, the Texas legislature passed a law, SB 11, that was designed primarily to address safety concerns at schools. Uh, it also required the Commissioner of Education to adopt or amend current rules to, quote, include the use of best practices for the design and construction of new facilities and the improvement, renovation, and retrofitting of existing facilities, end quote. So in response, the Texas Association of School Administrators, TASA, created a school facilities committee to review TEA's existing school facility standards and submit proposed additions and revisions. And ultimately, the committee grew to 22 members selected from across Texas. There were also 15 additional subcommittees uh, comprising 95 members from a wide range of professional associations and districts. Uh, Jennifer was on one of those subcommittees, so she has a little bit of insider knowledge about that. But in general, the committee itself was charged with three primary goals. Number one was to eliminate redundancy so where standards duplicated existing statutory or regulatory requirements, uh, they could be done away with. Uh, the second priority was to inform state level legislation for issues that the committee believed should be universal mandates. And the third one was to create a flexible framework that would allow districts to adapt as education continues to evolve. The committee's proposals were submitted to TEA and made available for public comment about a year ago and then last October, TEA published the final version of the new school facility standards, now known as Section 61.1040. They went into effect last November. So the new standards that are contained in Section 61.1040 apply to school district instructional facilities and all open enrollment charter school instructional facilities. And they include a requirement that school districts create educational specifications for new instructional facilities, a requirement that districts create and maintain a long range facilities plan. Uh, this had previously been optional, but now it is mandatory. Also included new safety and security standards uh, and some amended procurement requirements that align better to existing law that's already in the Texas government code in order to better protect taxpayer resources. Also included new square footage requirements for instructional spaces, common areas, and special spaces like gyms and science labs. Uh, and then it provided some new methods to demonstrate compliance with the standards. Some of these are uh, pretty self-explanatory if you read the, the section. So what we're going to focus on today are the ones that may have some district facility leaders scratching their heads a little bit, or where complying with these updated regulations may require a greater investment of district time or resources. So that is the stage. And with that, I want to ask both of you, so what's your reaction to these changes? Uh, is there anything that surprised you or that stands out to you in particular? Well, I'll be happy to, to go first. Um, as being on a, one of the subcommittees, as you mentioned, I was on the educational specification subcommittee. And um, honestly, it just seems like we started that work so long ago. <laughs> Um, that it's nice to finally see this come to fruition. Um, you know, years ago, a lot of the times when we talked about what what does TEA require in our facilities, um, you know, there was often confusion or um, comments about, well, this was what was required, you know, 20 years ago. 
Um, I can recall a specific situation in which uh, I used to be on the contractor side and I had a school district customer um, who told me they had been written up for something by TEA related to facilities um, in, in regard to light levels. And so I had actually contacted um, TEA at the time because it didn't match, you know, what what they were saying and what they had documented from somebody who had visited did not match with the guidance either. And 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 uh, really, what I thought was, I've heard this my whole career that this particular thing is a requirement, but I've never actually seen that. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to pick up the phone um, and call. And uh, at the time, I got a hold of Gary Merrick, who had been at TA for a, a certain period of time, and he kind of laughed. And, and I thought, wow, this is really telling that a lot of times we just have these stories that kind of keep being repeated about what facility standards are and what they mean. Um, and you get a hold of the, the guy who's really in, at the time was in charge of um, kind of communicating those. And, and he's in alignment with what I'm saying. You know, this wasn't really a standard necessarily. So I think. Um, that confusion or just lack of clarity. Um, it's certainly nice to see a review of things that have been in place for a long, long time and think about, are we doing the things that are right for students? You know, are we really taking a look at this again and thinking about this from the lens of, of an educator? Um, that really is the primary purpose of our organization. I often joke that our job could be a lot easier from a facilities perspective if we got rid of all the teachers and students, but <laughs> but our primary function is not to have excellent facilities. Our primary function is to provide the support of facilities for the education uh, and, and for the benefit of our students and our communities. So um, I was really excited to see this finally come through. I, I frankly um, have spent a lot of time in the finance arena in the last couple of years, so I've kind of lost track of how that evolution took place. Like you said, there were 95 people on this sub on the various subcommittees, lots of input um, over a certain period of time. And, and um, overall, I think it is nice to see that there is an updated view um, of some of these items. Yeah, Julie, I remember you saying that you didn't see anything in here that, you know, was particularly out of step with what y'all were already doing in Louisville. So, Again, was this sort of confirming of, OK, we're doing sort of best practice uh, already uh, or is there anything in there that you looked at that you said, OK, we, we need to revisit something or something? Wow. OK, they're, they're more concerned about this than I would have thought. That's a great question. Thanks for having us on, Mark. First, I want to say thank you for bringing us together to talk about these these kinds of subjects. Um, it's like you said, my initial response uh, when I read the, the, you know, the new government code in the section was, oh, great, we're already doing all of this. You know, that kind of, you know, you know, you find out later what the measuring bar is or what the criteria is later after you've taken the test and you go, fantastic. I don't even have to study. This is great. <laughs> I feel like we're doing a great job. Um, so, so in summary, I, I would say that I'm not. Um, none of the, the requirements are out of line with what I would expect um, other ISDs to be implementing, um, and, and they're not out of line with what we're already doing. There are a couple of the, um, the demonstration to compliance pieces that um, some of our teams are doing better than others, and so now that this is a requirement, um, we'll just implement it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, just hearing that will lower some anxious nerves for anyone listening who is, you know, again, because TEA is not always the, the the easiest when you read sort of this dense language, this regulatory language, and sometimes you're left with, okay, what does that exactly mean? Um, so uh, I think that's good news. Uh, you know, what I wanted to, to really focus on in our time together was, um, you know, sort of three of those topics. So the educational specifications piece, uh, the long range facility plan, and then uh, a couple of things out of that, the safety and security uh, you know, yeah, area that was addressed, because I think that those are um, yeah, maybe worthy of a little bit more, more uh, consideration. Uh, and since Jennifer was on the subcommittee for educational specifications anyway, I definitely want to leverage uh, her insight. So 
one of the things that really stood out, there was a, a sentence in the regulations that dealt with that said all new construction or major renovation projects are now required to have a written set of educational specifications that are approved by the board of trustees and then delivered to the architect. And actually that's me paraphrasing. That's, that's not the language there, but so this is, is something that's done before construction ever begins and sort of formalizes the, the architect's role in that. Um, so let me just start, Jennifer, since you were at the, the table when, you know, these things were developed, what was the, the purpose of these, um, you know, educational specifications as written in here? That's a great question. I think it, you know, as much as I kind of joked with some of my architect friends that I'm, I'm sure this is a great way for you to generate more revenue. Um, <laughs> I really think that so many of us have experienced what happens on the, even during design or on the backside of construction, um, that sometimes just not enough thought goes into the end use of a space. Um, and when I used to be on the contractor side, I know there were times where um, I would complete a project and there would be a question. And I thought, oh, my gosh, if I had known this when we were designing, you know, I would have done things differently. I, I could have done some things to make this better for the end user. Um, so from that perspective, I think that the idea was really that education should drive our design. Um, our, our final use plans should drive how we how we uh, structure those design meetings and our facilities. So um, one of the concerns that I had at the time, frankly, I, I worked with a, a medium sized district at the time. I worked for a very large urban district um, with 75 campuses. And currently I work in a district with five campuses. Um, so one of the things that I was concerned about was the time um you know, that it takes to build an educational specification um, and when it's required to do that. Um, so some of those trigger points really probably took far more of that discussion of the subcommittee than might have been necessary. But um, really, I, th I think the goal is to ensure that we're driving the design of our facilities to what those educational specifications are, because they're quite they can be quite different. Um, just as an example, um, I was a, a part of doing some reprogramming for high school additions in the last several years. And one of the things that we were looking at was what is our educational delivery method? What do we expect of teachers? Do we expect them to have a teacher station where they're, they're, they're staying in one spot? Um, are we expecting them to travel the room? Are we expecting students to be stationary? Are we expecting them to collaborate in small groups? This has a huge impact on what that space looks like. Um, and really, I think I, I was trying to challenge myself to really think about this from, a, you know, really a, a modern educational perspective, maybe not the way that I went to class. <laughs> um, so I had to challenge myself to do that. I also had to challenge myself to step back when that wasn't necessarily, when there were components of that that weren't necessarily what, what our instructional staff wanted. Um, you know, they wanted some pieces of this and they wanted some pieces of this. Um, and I think that that was, you know, that was kind of the first time I'd really delved into looking at what we do in a space relative to instruction and how we design around that. Um, so I really think that it's putting, putting the first thing first. Um, but I also think that it's something that we have to think about, um, the timing, doing it at the right time when we can develop things accordingly um, and also ensuring that it's not something where personally i don't think we need to spend um you know months and months and months developing educational spec uh specifications for say a swimming pool i mean <laughs> we've also got to apply some common sense around um what type you know how detailed we want to go with that i had a very very brief a uh, design guideline that I've kind of leaned on for the last 15 years, um, because we all know how big a spec book is. We weigh those by the pound at this point. Um, but really that brief delivery of what we're going to do in this space is far more um, helpful to drive that design process, I think. Now, do both your districts already use ed specs? Was, is that a practice that you've had even before it became mandatory in this? 
the districts I were in did not have okay. um, have that specification. Okay. Really so so we see a little bit there. So and that's interesting because you Jennifer came from you know smaller and larger districts. So mm -hmm. uh, so Julie, let me let me. Let me, yeah. let me ask you, Julie, since you guys have been doing it, what's your process for developing those? Um, oh, wow, I'm stuck on that's mind blowing. I can't think of a project that I've worked on K through 12 ever where we haven't used ed specs. So um, this is this is revealing. It helps me understand what these guidelines were created for. It's for not, not just for the giant ISDs. This, this is Julie figuring out now that maybe there was a purpose to the webinar. <laughs> Somebody's getting value from this. I'm, so, yeah, I'm sometimes glad. slow, a little slow on the uptake. I, I see I see now, you know, kind of, um, yeah, what, what the standards were written written for. I mean, we're, we're a giant school district and we've been using ed specs as long as, um, you know, as long as I can remember, uh, even when I was involved, I was involved with this school district on the design side as an architect back, you know, 20 something years ago. And, and we had ed specs in place in all of the K through 12 districts I've worked with and supported in different ways over these, you know, last 22 years. Same, always, always had ed specs. So I guess I, um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about how challenging that would make the design team and the owner's job uh, if we didn't have these ed specs, I don't even know how you did it in those districts before. You, you know what I'm saying? The the ed specs are a, are they're a guideline. They they um they're con they represent constraints, um and they help kind of keep us between the guardrails when it comes to design. They help us maintain consistency. This is not a, a webinar about ed specs and the value of them. I know that, but um I, I definitely see why. I can see why this was, you know, sort of implemented in the TEA standards. They are needed, and not only that, help manage client expectations. If that yeah, makes sense. You know, and I, and I think especially now, I mean, the client, the climate, the economic climate for anybody who is starting construction anytime soon, obviously, it is tremendously challenging in this post-COVID world with supply chain disruptions and labor shortages and inflation. And um, so, you know, I, I think it, it, that keeping you between the guardrails, at least, it helps manage some of that risk as best you can potentially what's your process for developing them you know for somebody who doesn't have this like what's what's a, a kind of a, a a quickie guide to how to approach this at least conceptually or or, or process wise well two or three things uh, before i came on board the ed specs were developed with a committee 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 based ed specs with um quite a few stakeholders that had input um in into creating the document my opinion is that EdSpec should be a, a tool and a live document, um, editable or in, uh, improved iterations are necessary as, as things change. We know that our environment is changing, like you just mentioned with the with COVID in the last couple of years. So ed, we need to be able to adjust uh, along with that. So um, for, for our ISD hours, we have been, you know, capturing kind of these um, minor changes that we've seen that need to be made along the way. They're not perfect. There's no way to get a perfect ed spec. Um, and so uh, recently we've been improving our ed specs in the way of fine arts. That's one of our areas that we've been focusing on is um, we, we kind of captured the information, um, you know, for fine arts ed specs. And then uh, we have um, a, a new, new, she's not new, she's been here a while. Um, but a, a new fine arts director, and she's very, very detail oriented. And um, she's helped us really kind of tighten the bolts on these ed specs. Um, so that's, so that's who's doing that capturing. Is that just, you know, the people who are are using the existing facilities is, you know, if I'm a, a, a theater arts teacher, say, and, and I'm saying, hey, you know what, um, I really would be able to, to be a lot more effective if I had a black box here. And, you know, if we're going to build a, a new school. We, we should probably make sure that every every stage area has a black box for uh, our students as well. I mean, is it that kind of level or is it the architects who are coming in and and, and helping do some assessments or a combination? Um, certainly the key stakeholders, like you mentioned, the, the campus theater arts um, teacher, uh, but also our our director of fine arts who oversees all of the campuses that's an even more holistic view so uh we we really 
lean on her expertise um, to, to improve, you know, the ed specs specific, specificity. What? Anyway, cut that out, please. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the specifics on the ed specs. Um, but that that's just one area where we're making refinements to our ed specs. That's become apparent to us that we can really um, refine ed specs in, in this area. So that's what we're doing. We've not found refinements in a lot of other areas thus far. That doesn't mean we're not going to. Hopefully we will. I mean, hopefully we'll learn and grow and improve and all the things. Okay. Well, thanks. I, I, I think that uh, the idea of those being sort of this living document, I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, probably take some of the, the pressure off too, when it's not like you're, you're cramming for the exam, trying to get this thing done to get in front of the board at the next meeting, right? It's okay. We're taking what we had and this is this evolving set. Uh, so Jennifer, let me ask you, there was something um, that, that I noticed in um, the, uh, the language uh, in the ed spec <coughs> section that talked about inclusive design goals, uh, which was really interesting to me. And I think is reflective again of sort of that changing the changing paradigm of education so can you just talk a little bit is that you know what what was the intent of, of that um what does that mean for anybody who is maybe struggling inclusion is one of those words that we use a lot in education but it can also mean a lot of different things it can and i honestly don't recall that conversation in the subcommittee. <laughs> um so i'm sure it was probably added later um and i'm thinking that really the intent behind that was likely to just ensure that we're not um, assuming that each student is really approaching education in the same way um, and ensuring that we provide educational opportunities for all. Uh, but I really don't know what the thought was with that, to be honest. There we go. It's another question for TEA. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> we knew we'd find some of those. So yeah, I you know I, one of the things that I think is is challenging, and sometimes I think that the um, the general public doesn't always understand it, is that I mean, these are buildings that are being designed to last decades. Mm -hmm. And you know if you think about the way that education, and I'm I'm an old curriculum and instruction guy, and so you know I think about the way that I grew up and the sage on the stage model, you know desks in rows. Um, it's so different now already with this, you know, the integration of more technology, cross-curricular, interdisciplinary opportunities, uh, emphasis on 21st century skills. Um, and so, yeah, what, what does this look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? And, you know, how do you build that into your specs in a way that allows the buildings to change and meet the adapting needs of the students that we serve? Um, I, you know, it seems like that is a, a challenge. So maybe this is, is, you know, part of the intent to address that. Uh, you know, is that something that y'all sort of, you know, wrestle with when it comes to sort of writing these kind of specifications, knowing that, you know, what's good in 2022 or 2023 um, may feel a little outdated by 2030? Or is that something that you just say, you know, we'll just have to cross that bridge when we get to it because, you know, every day's got troubles enough of its own. Well, we'll put up walls and take down walls yeah. and put up walls and take down walls. <laughs> if we look at kind of the 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 varying philosophies around school construction, right? Um, but I do think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Um, these are public facilities. And the reality is, um, you know, I grew up on the East Coast and public facilities last 200 years up there. <laughs> but, um, you know, really, we, we, there's a longevity approach that needs to be taken to, to ensure that we you know, we're doing what we can maybe in the next 20 years, what we think we're going to do instructionally. And then maybe we look at that again, right? Hopefully and on from a renovation perspective, but that sustainability is an important piece. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious what you guys have had discussions with. I mean, we've done brief versions of kind of sort of ed specs, you know, in prior years, uh, uh, but the development and the collaboration is something that I think needs to continue to increase so that we do have everybody around the table, those that know that we're going to have this facility uh, far beyond when your director of fine arts retires and somebody new comes in with perhaps a different educational philosophy and, and how you, you know, hear and, and design around all those things. 
And the, the, I would just say also to tap into that, Jennifer, the, the curriculum group, they really drive these kinds of discussions for us, the collaboration piece and what to focus on and that kind of thing. It, it really makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help but notice um, that, that um, well, I'll, I mean, I'll just tell you, I just read a little bit of research not too long ago about students and learning. And I, I came across this quite by accident. I was not looking for research on students and learning. I wish I could say I was, that I was doing this for work. I was not. I was, you know, enjoying some reading. And and as far as uh, how students learn, the, the sage on the stage, you said that, and it kind of reminded me, the sage on the stage. So here's what's interesting. If you have a really charismatic speaker, a great sage on the stage, someone who's going to uh, do the, the Socratic method, that kind of thing, the students will respond that they enjoy that more. Is that surprising to you? It's surprising to me. I didn't want to just be like listen all day as a as a student. They they say they enjoy it more if you have a really charismatic speaker. Um, but you learn more and retain more by the interactive learning, the collaboration piece. So I don't know. I just thought that was fascinating that the collaboration piece. We're going to learn more and retain more. But that the data says that whenever you whenever you um, ask students what who they enjoyed more, or what teacher they enjoyed more, or what what method they enjoyed more, most of them will respond that they they enjoyed listening to someone um, teach. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I, so I'll tell you. So Michael Schmoker, uh, his book Focus, which is is great, um, he did some research on it because that sort of direct instruction has gotten such a bad rap in the last few years. And he found the same thing is that, you know, that direct instruction can be very effective used strategically. Uh, and he was looking specifically at social studies, which I'm an old social studies teacher and curriculum coordinator. And what I would tell my teachers was there's nothing wrong with doing that, but don't do it for 45 minutes straight. <laughs> like, you know, it's it's varying it up. And so for me, the idea of these flexible learning environments is really critical because it's what I would want to do is we're going to have a, a micro lecture of maybe, you know, seven to 10 minutes of setting the stage for them. And then I want them to split up into collaborative groups and examine, you know, primary documents and have rich discussions as they interrogate that source. That's, that's for me. And then, and then at the end, we're going to come back together. And it's going to be some kind of an assessment about what they've learned. Right. And that could be a, a discussion or share out or some kind of a uh, little dipstick formative assessment. But, you know, I want a space that ideally lets me do some of that. And um, I think that's a, a huge challenge, you know, and I know at one point that one of the districts that I, I previously worked for when we were looking at um, different campuses out there as, as comps for a, a new campus, new middle school that was being planned. Uh, we went to one that was absolutely great, like space age stuff and you know movable walls and i mean it was just it was like this crazy teachers to what you said earlier uh jennifer like they did not have a teaching station um they shared a common room somewhere else on the campus where they had it was you know like a big communal office they had a desk there that's where their phone was but the idea was that um you know the classroom was was not their own space it was a space for learning and their principal told me it was like yeah this is too advanced for us. Like, you know, my, my teachers don't really like this. This is, this is more building than we need right now. But what was interesting was that she said, but I'm not sure that's going to be the same in 10 or 15 years. And so we've got the building now that maybe is going to be used more fully for what it was intended in the future. Uh, and I think, again, yeah, it comes back to that, that kind of that challenge. Um, and, and I think that, that that is a good pivot to, you know, this idea of a long range facility plan. Um, so let's let's talk about that. So this was another major change um, that said that districts now must create and maintain a long range facility plan that has to be presented to the school board, although uh, it doesn't require approval. So the ed specs, according to regulations, the board actually has to vote on and approve. This is just a plan that has to be presented to them. Uh, district has to make it available to the prime design professional, so the architect in most cases, uh, before embarking on a, a capital improvement project. Uh, my first thought on, on this, uh, well, let me ask you this. So uh, your districts, are you already doing long range facility plans? I'm afraid to tell you the date of one of these binders behind me. Um, <laughs> yes, we very, have them. Very long range. Um, 
we have done long range facility planning, but um, in our particular district and, and really in a lot of districts with COVID, um, we've really had to take a, a updated look at our demographic projections, our enrollment, um, what's happening has, has changed dramatically. Whereas five years ago, we thought the district thought they were building for more. Um, we actually have declining enrollment. So um, while we're a, very much a sought after district, um, it, you know, our average home price is like $800,000 or something. So um, we just don't see that huge influx of, of students necessarily. So um, I think for us, it's just been incumbent. We're going to update our long range capital plan um, starting next year. We've had to focus on some financial sustainability items this year. Um, but I do think it's something that most districts have done at some point. Um, but we have to continually look at that with fresh eyes prior to, in my opinion, prior to deciding we're going to do a bond program. Like that's that's cart before the horse in a major way. Um, so really thinking about being knowledgeable on those things. Uh, I'll give you another example. In my prior district, we had had a, a significant storm and we had replaced 20 campus roofs and HVAC systems at the same time. Um, so I didn't leave because I knew eventually there was going to be a giant bond that did it all over again, I promise. But, um, you know, being cognizant of things like that, like our entire district's MEP and roofing was going to age out at the same time. Um, and, and I think that's something that, uh, unfortunately, because one of the effects of COVID has also been a lot of changeover of staff in districts. Some of that, um, you know, information is unfortunately lost. So just the updating and the continual evaluation of our plans, I think, is really important. Yeah, it seems like that that data piece is critical for really knowing what those needs are as opposed to, you know, because it's easy to look at the, um, you know, we're getting X number of new students. We need to build a new campus. Uh, from a planning perspective, but uh, I know uh, yeah, having been part of some fast growth districts, you know, there's there's sometimes a tendency to prioritize those over the existing building needs. And yeah, those those things are aging out. Uh, and, you know, you end up with these kind of dramatic inequities sometimes across one district if it's large enough. So, Julie, what what uh, do you guys use, um, you know, some sort of long range plan now already? It's very similar. The situation is very similar to what what Jennifer said. I, I we have a long range plan. I don't I don't know the last time it was updated, but we we are constantly having demographic studies done to help us create our or incorporate into our bond planning. Um, you know, recently we we had an elementary school that was scheduled to open. Um, let's see, 2020. 20, 20, 20, and then we pushed it back to twenty twenty one because we just didn't need it. We just yeah. didn't need it until that time. So mm -hmm. things change. Um, and the demographers are, are the groups that, that help us um, kind of create those forecasts and, and help us build these um, models that help us build the bond package. So yes, yes, long range uh, facility plan is certainly important. I am not, uh, I don't have a position or a, an opinion yet on how often they should be updated. I'm kind of like you, it's a tool that's refined at appropriate intervals, appropriate intervals. That's what I would say. I, I um, think TEA has said five years. So yeah. Yeah. all right, we'll do that. I think if, if I remember these, these regulations correctly, um, it was five years. So uh, one thing I thought was, was was interesting was that they do give districts the option between having a facilities plan per campus or per per building or also or in, in place of that having a district-wide one uh it sounds like what y'all have in place are those district-wide ones you know is that what you would recommend do you see that you know there's some pros and cons to each approach uh i'm just i'm kind of you know curious that they provided this option instead of just saying you got to have a district plan instead they said well you have to have a campus plan but you know what if you want to roll that into your district plan that's okay too i i bring my a, a fairly myopic view of we we have a pretty rigorous isd i guess as it turns out we have a our facilities uh, maintenance group creates a puts together every year a facilities assessment report. And it is very detailed. If you ever want to look at it, it's online. 
um, if that's you know helpful for, for anyone who's listening or watching. But we have a plan of action for every single campus that we are we've already built, um, and and we we have projections on when each piece of uh, equipment and which finishes and um, roofing all the things when they need to be replaced when they were last replaced and when they will reach their end of life so that's for the existing facilities and then the long range plan of course addresses uh, the new build so um, like I said we're as it turns out I think we're a fairly sophisticated district when it comes to facilities and construction so we have a, a decent plan in place. So when I read the TEA material and requirements, I, I did the, you know, kind of shrugged my shoulders and went, great, we're in compliance. Nice <laughs> when you find out you're in compliance right away, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a better feeling than the alternative, right? Sure. Yeah. And that certainly if we felt like we had work to do, we, we would figure it out. And there are some minor areas uh, where we're, we have a little work to do, but it, it's not going to be hard. So, so Jennifer, you you have, I'm guessing you have a smaller number of campuses. So, you know, the district wide plan works fine because it allows you to sort of address all of those probably within its its, uh, you know, content. Yes, I think most um, districts would do a, a district wide plan as opposed to a campus specific plan. But I do think it's important to highlight that while what 80 percent of Texas students go to school in 20 percent of the districts. Um, in these large districts, a lot of them in urban areas. Um, you also have to remember there are over a thousand school districts in the state of Texas, and some of them truly only have um, two or three campuses. When I first started doing, you know, school renovation, I was working primarily with with uh, rural school districts with, you know, 500 to 5,000 students, um, and it's a it's it's a completely different experience. So uh, for those folks, it may make more sense to do a single that's the environment where I think okay maybe like if you've got an elementary a junior high and a high school and the junior high and high school share a building and your enrollment has been this for 20 years how much you know is it really worth and you have limited staff you know we we have extremely limited staff where I am it's me and a maintenance supervisor um and we're running it the show <laughs> from a facilities perspective so um as much and i do finance too so as much as i would love to have a fully developed uh plan for each you know area right now we kind of have to think about um what julie said is when is the appropriate time so um yes obviously we're gonna now look at having a, a five-year cycle to a, a long-range facility plan but for some of those smaller districts it may make sense to kind of just look at one campus um every five years if they're primarily driven by say their their one secondary school Mm -hmm. um so it definitely varies um but i think most districts would probably lean towards the the district-wide approach so even though i only have five campuses um we closed a third elementary school last spring um and so you know even with two elementary schools you have shifts and opportunities with your student population right so at that point you're going to have a little bit of a myopic view if you don't look at the district perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. So what are the the elements, regardless of whether or not you do this at the campus level or like most districts, we anticipate we do it at the district wide level? What are the, the elements that need to be in that plan? So it sounds like Julie has a lot of right. really good, robust planning. And so I'm going to get a pin as we begin ours next year and write down everything she says. I will. I'll do you one better. I'll send it to you. <laughs> Um, and then it also reference where it is on the website. That's a facilities assessment plan, but it is a fantastic roadmap to uh, planning on how we're going to update and maintain these facilities. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. So that would be the representative of the maintenance piece, how we're going to maintain our buildings well. And then the new builds, I know it sounds like I'm oversimplifying it, but I think it is pretty simple. We, we lean on our demographers uh, recommendations and their findings and where we are with enrollment and um, where we where we need to build. So it's kind of two pronged is what I would say, unless there's something in the TEA um, code that I missed. Did they note anything else, Mark? 
you know, they, they mentioned you have to have it. I have not seen anything and I'm sure somebody will email us uh, or leave a comment if I'm, I'm wrong, but I didn't see a lot of details about what's supposed to be in it. Um, and that I find interesting because, you know, it's, I mean, education, sometimes um, we are guilty of uh, doing things for the sake of compliance. And it seems like this could be a really valuable tool. And that's what I'm hearing, you know, you say is that it gives you that roadmap going forward and really helps spread out some of the, the financial pain or, you know, understand, um, you know, what your bonds should look like and, you know, how you ideally, um, you know, deal with aging facilities as well as, as new builds. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of curious, like, okay, if we didn't get guidance about what should be in the plan itself, what makes sense to include um, that would actually, you know, help it be that roadmap? Renovations, new builds. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, 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 I'm keeping it simple. Renovations and new builds. That's the plan. That's what I would include. And then look for TEA's guidance beyond that. And I can give you, Jennifer, if you're interested uh, later, I can give you some um, ideas on how we have compiled our facility assessment. Our facilities team is fantastic and they do a great job. There's a lot of work up front, but it pays off. It, I'm sure that's true. It definitely does. I. Um, the only other piece I thought of in addition to looking at new construction needs um, for student growth, also shifting demographics. So I worked in a large urban district at the time. It was the ninth largest district in Texas, and we had a huge population shift from uh, west to east. Mm -hmm. So while our number of campuses was adequate, um, they were in the wrong spot. So of course, that leads to those conversations about do you look at changing your, um, you know, your uh, assignments for which students go to which campuses, or do you shift um, some of your campuses? So I think that's one other piece that I've had to look at before. Um, the MEP and the, the the systems piece is huge and often overlooked. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to hear that, that you're doing that, Julie, because it is huge. And oftentimes, um, in my past experience, sometimes the maintenance staff isn't included in that, which is, in my opinion, an oversight. Um, oftentimes they know kind of critical systems and, and the life of those systems isn't always by the book. <laughs> Sometimes we have extremely problematic systems that, um, you, you know, may not be as old as others. So, and then we may have older systems that currently are functioning just fine. And how do we make those decisions? Um, I remember coming in on the heels uh, in that large district of a large bond program and being frustrated about a campus that was still extremely dissatisfied. Um, with their MEP system because we did what I affectionately decided to term the pluck and plop method. We plucked a chiller out and plopped one in. So they should all be happy, right? No, we never corrected all the system changes and, and updates that needed to be made from 50 years ago when the first chiller was put in that building. So, you know, there's some intricacies with the, that side of it. So I think your approach is awesome to include all that in a systematic way each year. I mean, that's phenomenal. Um, and I think the only other thing I've thought I've, you know, kind of had to look at is back to that um, educational adequacy piece, like what are the usage changes of our facilities? And that may not apply in districts where your campuses are 20 years old at the oldest, but some of the older ones, you've got to kind of think about, mm, are there some other bigger changes we need to consider to this facility? Um, to your earlier point about, um, you know, providing all students with what they need. Um, have we looked at those, you know, buildings that may have been in place for 40 or 50 years and reconsidered any educational pieces um, that we may need to look at? You know, furniture is always one of those things, right? ff &E at the end of the day, at those older facilities. Um, a lot of districts don't really have, you know, retirement plans for those items. So <laughs> we just keep them until they fall apart. They, they end up in a portable somewhere stacked. <laughs> right. Uh, so we don't get a lot of details about what should be in it. The rule does require that we have to at least consider input from teachers, students, parents, taxpayers, and other school district stakeholders, it says. Uh, so that's a pretty broad cross section. So I'm curious, um, you know, how do you approach that? Uh, so Julie, you guys are already doing it. You have professional staff that's been, you know, pushing that ball forward. 
um, you know, does does that sort of change now um, the way that you have to approach it if you want to get those voices heard too? Is it something that your district advisory council begins to have a, a hand in, or uh, something that you create a dedicated uh, you know committee to deal with, or or something that if you have a you know a bond planning committee anyway, is it something that they could potentially have added to their plate? So I'm just kind of curious you know, with that requirement here to, to solicit that sort of input, you know, how does that affect the, the, the approach to creating this plan? Sure. Um, incorporating the input of other stakeholders beyond just the design team and the con contractors and uh, our folks, our department facilities and construction uh, beyond um, beyond using the information that we gather. It, it does make a lot of sense to ask the committee and teacher committee um, community and teachers and um, and staff. That makes a lot of sense. And and I think you're right. I think you've hit the nail on the head, Mark. I think uh, the bond planning committee is probably the right same group for this discussion. If we're if we're planning the bond, we're also looking at you know the long range plan. It's kind of, it's very in the same vein. I'm not mm -hmm. going to say very similar, but in the same vein. So that's the group um, that I think that we'll need to reach out to to make sure that this plan is updated every five years. And so at the risk of sounding um, too comfortable with the TEA standards, um, so far, uh, up until now, I felt, I felt like I could probably handle all the standards that have been addressed with an email or two. I mean, literally, we can handle this and close it out. But uh, not, not, this, not this piece, engaging um, other stakeholders will take a little bit uh, more thought and um, strategy, but I'm confident we can do this too. So Jennifer, you know, what, what do you think about that? Is that something, have, have y'all given any thought to, you know, how you engage the wider community or something like this? Yes, we have. So um, I started in Lovejoy in July. And so we have spent an uh, extraordinary amount of time on rebuilding our financial sustainability. And um, the good part of that is we have an amazing community, um, very involved um, parents and community members across the board. So one of the things that we did this year um, is we developed a financial sustainability committee because that was just has definitely been my primary focus for the last several months. Um, but they've come in seven to eight times. Um, we've had seven or eight meetings this year and we have 40 members. Um, and what I did not expect, frankly, was the first meeting we had to be so inspired when we went around the room and each one of them shared their why that they were on the committee. You know, I was like ready to get into, you know, details and numbers and and a lot of them were too. But we took the time to do that. And I was just blown away by the fact that we have a community with so many people who care, who, and you know, there wasn't a single individual who really kind of came with a, with a, a hard nosed agenda. Um, certainly everybody has their interests, but everybody truly was bought into the, you know, what's going to help our district as a whole. And so I think what we want to do is carry that forward into our capital planning next year and look at our long range capital planning, um, as well as, you know, future edu educational specifications. We're not in a position to be really building anything new um, necessarily. So it's probably going to be a little bit more on the, you know, technology and infrastructure side. But uh, I think we kind of built a model for that this year. That's, the, you know, for that involvement. Um, and so I'm kind of excited about we did we did do a strategic planning group this year. and I had an operations subcommittee. Um, and they were phenomenal. Um, so I'm really hoping to kind of capitalize on that same approach next year um, as we develop a, a long range capital plan that will include some of those folks. Yeah, I, I really like that, honestly, because I, I feel like uh, anything we can do to engage the community uh, and, and bring people in and build trust mm -hmm. and provide mm -hmm. transparency is a good thing. You know, I know that looking at the bond election in November it was a little startling just how many bonds failed that normally pass. Right. You know, the bonds that are there for new schools or replacing HVACs or, or roofs or something. It wasn't just those lightning rod issues like stadiums and fine arts facilities. It was things that, you know, most of the time voters have said yes to without question. And it'll be interesting to me to see next month as we go through another cycle of bonds, you know, was November an outlier or does it reflect a growing maybe skepticism among voters? about how school districts are spending their money. 
And so it seems like this is an opportunity for districts to, you know, invite the community in in a way that engages them on a sustained basis and maybe, you know, helps show, you know, we're not asking for this just because we think it would be, you know, uh, uh, sort of a, you know, a fun add on. This is sort of essential to being able to provide a quality education. You know, we start to have leaky roofs, it's going to impact educational outcomes. The HVAC doesn't work very well in Texas. Woo. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, so with the, the time we have left, the last topic that I wanted to cover was uh, safety and security. And uh, this was one of the, the chief aims of SB 11, uh, which was the legislation that led to the creation of Section 61.1040. Um, th this all came in the wake of a deadly mass shooting at Santa Fe High School in 2018 in the Houston area. And so uh, included in the rule now are some very specific safety and security measures that districts uh, must ensure are in place either for new or renovated facilities. Uh, and there were a, a couple of things that, that jumped out to me. So one is the requirement of having adequate communications in the event of an emergency. Uh, and this was because, you know, there were stories about teachers who were trying to, to use their cell phones to call you know, sort of the office or somebody else on a cell phone to try to figure out what was going on and they couldn't get clarity. Um, I'm just, you know, wondering what is this from your vantage point? What does this, this new language mean in the, the context of the rule and the context of the, the climate that we're in? You know, when we talk about sort of adequate communications, is that, do you think that's a systems issue or is it, you know, sort of a hardware issue or is it both? That's a good question. I think it takes, you know, a, a really a multi-level approach. I know some of the things that they mentioned in the specifications, like exit door numbering, likely most of us in the Metroplex, at least, or in larger urban areas are doing that. Um, the communication piece is interesting. You know, often we are challenged in certain, you know, certain areas of certain buildings with, with cell signal. Um, and so we had a discussion about that actually earlier this year. We're doing some upgrades to our, our facilities. Our community is extremely um, uh, just supportive of safety and security for our students, so much so that they actually um, generate fundraising in the community to pay for our school marshals salaries. Oh, wow. Um, so we have more than, you know, a staffing guideline would indicate is necessary, uh, but our community actually pays their salary. Um, so, so this is something that Lovejoy's taken very seriously for quite some time. And actually, I'm just going to show you this. But um, each new employee, this is one of the first things I got when I worked here. Um, we all have a, a personal device that we can press the button in case of emergency. Um, and so that is not just teachers. That's every single staff member um, on their lanyard. So I think that's something that the district did far before I got here that has been uh, really just kind of a way, way step above um, what I was accustomed to. But I think that communication piece is, is really important. I think that the access control, the visitor management pieces, you know, we've been doing that for a long time. But if we're, that may be just one little area that we have to kind of think about in terms of communication. Um, wow, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by your key fob. We don't have those. I'm gonna have to ask you about that. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen that before. That is, that yeah. is great. Who did I did this year when I got here was I was gonna accidentally push the <laughs> in my purse. It might happen. Not. Good. I did want to ask how many false calls you get. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean they're so accustomed to it. Our employee base is that you know, but they will. The police will show up if if I push that. It, and is is there like a, a geolocation attached to it, mm -hmm. or you know, so it's all individualized? So. Mm -hmm. So you just have to press it. You don't have to to talk or or do anything mm -hmm. else. It's just wow. That's let's say let's say you're at home and it accidentally goes off. Please show up. So they're supposed to, or they will contact. So if it's out of district and it obviously appear, you know, yeah. uh, you know, it, it at that point it becomes a local jurisdiction, and you know, some jurisdictions will deploy regardless, um, just to do welfare checks. Others won't, but um. For whatever reason, I don't think we have a lot of, of false calls with that that um, specific strategy. Um, but yeah, it's been a, it, that's been a, a new fun thing. Wow, that's, that's great. So, Julie, what what are y'all doing in terms of that that communications piece? 
Right. So I hadn't really focused on the the communications piece and all my bullet points regarding the safety security. Um, that's not what stood out to me, Mark. Uh, so I was not ready for that question. Um, but I will think about it on my feet. So um, what did stand out to you? Uh, the thing, most of the things, of course, that, that we're already doing, the exterior door numbering with the um, reflective door numbering so that the, the safety and security personnel know where to go in the event of an issue. And the like like Jennifer mentioned, the access monitoring and the access control and um, certainly lots, quite a bit of um, impact resistant film and bullet resistant film and, and um, bullet resistant um, windows and glass and that kind of thing. Um, and security cameras, we, we've been doing that for years, but we've incorporated more. Um, and then door access control. We The very first two projects that we executed, or two of the first projects that we executed in the first year of our 2017 bond were access controls across the entire district. So we had 90 campuses to upgrade and provide card readers uh, for. And then also um, the um, secure vestibule, secure access. Um, project. And that also was for 90 campuses. Um, we did that year one because safety is a priority for LISD. That's why we did it uh, in year one. Um, so those are the features that um, I'd really been focused on, Mark. I hadn't been focused on communication, but we have a number of means of communication um, but we're, we're like Jennifer. There are some areas where we need to improve the cell service. There are some areas where we need to improve the, the ERRS, the emergency responder radio system. We've done that uh, on a number of the campuses and we'll be do, we continue to, do, to look at that. And that just means improving the, uh, making sure that whenever the, our SROs, our, um, our, our police officers on campus um, can communicate uh, well with the authorities, with the fire marshal and the fire department and the police department and all that kind of thing. And and we found that there are some schools that need to need an improved system and they're not free. <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> free. Right. They're not free. But we're we're incorporating them um you know where we can. Uh and like I said, we we continue to do that. But, so, so yeah. that I, I think, I think you, you sort of give me, um, you know, a, a great segue then into the last question that I want to ask you both, which nothing is free. So, what's your advice to districts that you know are looking at this and saying, man, we we have a lot of work we might need to do, right? In terms of you know, especially I'm thinking um, districts that may be smaller that may uh, you know not have had the internal capacity to develop or maintain some of these plans and that, you know, maybe haven't been writing these ed, ed specs as much because it just, you know, there was more of a, a common sort of unspoken consensus about what it should do rather than anything formal. Uh, you know, one that uh, they've, they've complied with some of the, the letter of the law here, but they're, they're also not, you know, they don't have key fobs that <laughs> have geolocation, right? You know, what's your advice to, to anybody who's watching this, who who's coming out of it and, you know, feeling like we've got a lot of work to do. Well, if they've been around a while in operations, they probably know this feeling, <laughs> <laughs> right? That feeling that, oh, there's so much to do. Um, and really anybody in a school district environment has probably experienced that at one time or another. Um, but one of the things that has kind of been my practice and, and being over the finance side as well, um, it, it, it just holds true across the board in so many ways is, Let's first identify what we need to do. Um, let's not, you know, and and even as the finance person who often has to say, not right now, or we need to find another way, um, you know, it, it's about identifying the right thing to do. What is the correct approach? What is the thing that we need to do? And then let's go figure out what's the most cost effective way we can do it. And what's the timing and what's the implementation look like? Well, do we need to look at phasing? Um, but I think that for that's just kind of general, general philosophical about how to how to approach operations needs and and construction needs and facility planning um, and capital planning as a whole. But once we've done that, I think it's um, just a, a lot of partnership around what what are the district's priorities and those should be developed by a full stakeholder group. You know, um, for us, safety and security is a huge priority. Um, and I've been in other districts where it was not a concern. 
Um, so it just, you know, you got also have to think about what your community is concerned about, um, prioritize appropriately and timing it. You know, when we talk about um, educational specifications, I am not developing one of those in the next year. It's not happening. Um, I'm not building a new building. I'm not adding on to anything. My district needs us to develop a capital plan. Um, so that and I know that this is not the year to do it. Uh, so we're going to start that work next year. So I think also kind of thinking through and having some general conversations with your leadership team about timing um, of those items and really things. I, I joked again about the educational spec. Oh, you're going to charge me for that. I've yet to be charged for an educational specification. Maybe I just work with nice people. Um, but, <laughs> but I have not um, seen a lot of capital outlay for that process. Um, the facility planning, yeah, it, it's probably going to take a little bit of an outlay from the standpoint of working with, with others. A lot of districts, um, like Julie shared, can do some of that work internally. And I think that's very beneficial, but it may be worth a very small investment to look at, um, you know, the planning part of that. And, and does it make sense to have some software to support that or whatever the case may be? Um, you know, those outlays are very small. I mean, so small in comparison with what you're going to spend in any kind of renovation or construction program. So um, I think that's kind of my general thoughts on on how to plan around that, the costs associated with any of these items. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So, Julie, you get the uh, final word on this. Uh, the final word. Oh, scary. That's definitely scary. I, I'm in full agreement with Jennifer, identifying the priorities. And and like you mentioned also, if we don't have the funds to do each of these or incorporate each of these priorities now, there's always a way to incorporate or create a phasing plan. There's always a way to create a long-term you know, schedule, that kind of thing. And, and the only thing that I would add is something I've learned today from Jennifer. Uh, I am... Amazed. I'm saying wow because because of the question of why that you asked of the stakeholder group. You went to the stakeholder group whenever you were talking about a financial plan. You're looking for financial stability, right? And the first question you ask the stakeholders is, "What is your why?" I think that's fascinating um, and probably undervalued. It's not. It wouldn't have been my go-to. It wouldn't have been the first thing uh, that I did in that meeting. Um, but. I think I might now. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. You gain you gain buy in. You gain trust. You understand one another uh, early. You know early on at a, at a next you know uh, a faster rate, right? And then in addition to that, you never know by opening up that door uh, way to vulnerability. You never know how much more creative your team is going to be. So vulnerability almost equals creativity. It's like you might get some great ideas on how to solve this almost unsolvable problem. So that's, that's my extra why it's a little bit, a little bit soft for the people that are going to be watching this, but I think it, it's powerful. I, I love that. I think that's a great way to, to end it. Um, you know, I think that uh, ultimately whether it's in the classroom or on the facility side, it's still about community and building relationships and, uh, and getting buy-in. So I think you're spot on. Uh, so I, I just, uh, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I hope it has not been traumatic for either of you. Uh, I, I appreciate it. If it wasn't for you, it wasn't for us. No, no. I, I appreciate your your viewpoints and your expertise has been great. Uh, and I think it's been really helpful uh, for anyone who's, again, trying to make sense of what do these regulations really mean? So we've had a chance to sort of, you know, talk through some of the features together. There's a lot more, obviously, uh, that's out there. We didn't get into uh, some of the nitty gritty in terms of demonstrating compliance and square footage, but you know, uh, I think that uh, maybe that's a, a topic for for some future group to look at. So, uh, but in the meantime, um, many many thanks to jo Dr. Jennifer Duplessis from Lovejoy ISD, Julie Sands from Louisville ISD. You guys are great. We appreciate you so much and what you do for the students and families of your communities as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jennifer.